Hello and welcome back to the Coin Stories podcast. I'm your host, Natalie Brunel, and I'm talking to leading voices in Bitcoin and macroeconomics about their origin stories, Bitcoin headlines and news topics, and this movement to fix the world by fixing the money. This podcast does not provide financial advice. Before I share this week's episode, here are some messages from my sponsors who make this show possible. First of all, are you ready for Bitcoin 2023? I certainly am. This year's Bitcoin conference was absolutely amazing. I got to spend a week in Miami with tens of thousands of Bitcoiners from around the world. And I'm so grateful that I had the chance to anchor Bitcoin Magazine's live desk and MC the main stage. If you missed the event, you can catch all three days of incredible Bitcoin content over on Bitcoin Magazine's YouTube channel. And also, it's never too early to start making plans to attend the next conference. Bitcoin 2023 tickets are already available and super early bird rates do not last long. So you can visit b.tc slash conference slash 2023 and secure your pass before prices increase. This show is also powered by OKCoin, my favorite place to DCA without the crazy fees. OKCoin recently launched an amazing initiative called Crypto for All, which is aimed at democratizing knowledge and access to Bitcoin. OKCoin is one of the fastest growing and most secure global cryptocurrency exchanges that serves all your needs for Bitcoin and is committed to investing in educational content, funding crypto developers and entrepreneurs from underrepresented groups, and helping more diverse talent work on crypto ecosystem projects and careers. OKCoin has actually contributed more than a million dollars to Bitcoin core devs and counting, has one of the most active lightning nodes and recently launched sats mode. To open an account and start stacking, head to okcoin.com slash Natalie and get $50 in Bitcoin when you sign up. All right, welcome to the show. I'm excited because I've been wanting to do an episode on Bitcoin mining for a while. I don't think you can fully understand and appreciate the Bitcoin network until you really understand Bitcoin mining. And you know what? I get it. It could be super complicated and intimidating, especially for those of us with no computer science background. You hear things in the media like computers competing to solve complicated cryptographic puzzles and you go, What does that even mean? So I wanted to help break down how the technology works and really simplify the message. And I couldn't think of anyone better to talk to than D++. She is an expert and educator in the space. And I heard her give a talk on Bitcoin mining at the Unconfiscatable Conference. And I had never heard it explained so simply and in a way that was so easy to visualize. So I wanted her to come on the show and talk about everything from SHA-256 to hash functions and proof of work overall. So with that said, here's D++ on Bitcoin mining. Well, D, thank you so much for joining me. I've been really wanting to chat with you because I've never heard a more simple and easy to understand way to explain mining. So thank you for coming on the show. That's so kind. I really appreciate that. You know, I had read these articles in the mainstream media saying that Bitcoin mining was a process of solving crazy cryptographic puzzles or solving really difficult math problems. And of course, neither of those explanations made any sense to me then. They make zero sense to me now. And you can imagine that I was delighted to find that mining is a much, much simpler process than that, that anyone can understand. You don't have to be able to solve crazy cryptographic problems. Well, it's funny that you even said that because I used to work in mainstream media and I'm pretty sure that the places I worked, we really, we described it exactly the way you just said. Computers solving math problems, competing against each other, cryptographic puzzles, all of it. And it is like, now I look back and that's completely confusing for the average person. It probably sounds like nonsense. So with your help, I want us to kind of break down mining. Um, But first, let's hear just a little bit about your background, because I didn't know when I when I saw your name, D++ online on Twitter, that that's like a a language or a like computer programming term. Yeah. So plus plus is a mathematical operator. That means increment by one. C++ was the first computer language that I learned when I was 14. And so I think um, you'll understand I was delighted to find that Bitcoin is written in C++. So Uh I heard about Bitcoin in 2012. I bought my first Bitcoin in 2013 when I realized that this was C++ money. (laughs) I thought that was incredible and I still do. And for the average person, like what does C++ mean? What does that, what does that mean? So it's a computer language. Um, when I first learned it, it was considered to be a very high level language. Um, by today's standards, it's moving more towards a lower level language, which means it's 
more difficult to understand than say some of the newer languages like Python. Mm -hmm. um, so it's definitely like a heavy lifting language that's used um, in a number of applications, including Bitcoin. Wow. And was your background basically computer science? You were just always interested in computers and programming? Uh, yeah. And I got my BS in computer engineering, which included some hardware design as well. Why were you interested in that? Like what brought you to this whole space? Well, I was interested in computer science because it's very creative and you get to create things and um, have the power to design like beautiful solutions to problems. So I always found that to be super compelling. That's so interesting. Okay. And so you discovered Bitcoin how, just because you were involved in computer science and in 2012, like you, what, how did you first see it? So I found out about Bitcoin because of the Silk Road in 2012. And I had kind of heard that they were doing this peer to peer marketplace, which I thought was really incredible. And then um, I sat down and I finally like took some time to actually buy Bitcoin in 2013. I didn't know really what I had. I didn't really know how magically important it was probably until 2019, if I'm honest. Really? Okay. Yeah, well, obviously so you went down this Bitcoin mining journey, right? Of trying to learn what it was because you heard people in mainstream news describe it in a ridiculous way. So why did you decide to really unpack it and now share that message? Right. Because when I understood mining, I understood Bitcoin. I realized that there were no crazy cryptographic puzzles and that anyone can comprehend this. So I really dedicated my life to explaining Bitcoin simply and helping everyone understand regardless of their technical ability. I love that. Okay. So let's get into it. Um, first of all, I guess when people ask you, what is Bitcoin mining? Is there like a simple kind of elevator pitch or explanation that you have that boils it down? Like what is Bitcoin mining? Yeah, so Bitcoin mining uses hash cash style proof of work to secure the Bitcoin network. So miners are actually security nodes on the network, and they do this using hashing operations. So what I like to tell people is, you know, can you compare two numbers? Can you look at two numbers and ascertain which one is larger, which one is smaller? And maybe in some cases they're equal. If you can compare two numbers, then you can understand Bitcoin mining. It's a very simple comparison game of two numbers. So the, what I then like to ask is, well, let's think about what numbers we're going to compare. And before I can talk about what numbers we're going to compare, I have to introduce the concept of hashing. Mm -hmm. So are you familiar with hashing operations? Well, yes, because of Bitcoin and through people like you, I understand that hashing is used all over the internet, right? And there is an input and an output. So I'll, I'll kind of let you go through it, but then I might ask some, I might pepper in some questions, but I know you have a beautiful way of explaining what is hashing and the input output. Definitely. So like you said, hashing predates Bitcoin. It's used extensively in cryptography all over the internet. So hashing is an operation that takes something in and spits something out. So you give me something, I give you something back. So let's talk about what goes into the hash function and what comes out. What goes into a hash function is anything you like. I call it the kitchen sink because I can give it a number, a word, a letter, a phrase, a sentence, the contents of an entire book. I could hash the contents of my entire hard drive um, or a cat photo, for example, or a cat video or a library of cat videos. So I can give it anything. Now, regardless of what I give it, it's always going to output a result of fixed length, regardless of the size or type of the input. That fixed length output can be thought of as being a summary or a unique fingerprint. So the output will always be unique, but it's deterministic, meaning the same input will always yield the same output. Now, this is used extensively in Bitcoin. It's used in Bitcoin transactions. It's used in key derivation. It's used in um, HD wallet derivation. It's used in addresses. And of course, it's used extensively in mining. But before I talk about how it's used in mining, I just want to make sure that we understand the basic concept of we give it anything and it gives us a fixed length result. Now, what it's doing is it's taking that input and it's rearranging it. It's like slicing it up and dicing it up and mixing and mashing and blenderizing it beyond the point of no return. 
So what this means is I can go into the hash function, but I cannot come back out. Just like I can blenderize some fruits and vegetables, but I cannot unblenderize my smoothie. It is a one way function. It is like a trap door. You can fall very easily into a trap door, but you cannot get out. Now for this reason, because I cannot undo the hash function, hashing is not a form of encryption. When we think about encryption, we think about plain text that gets converted into ciphertext, but we can decrypt it using a private key. Mm. With hashing, we can never decrypt the result. So it's not a form of encryption, although it does fall under the umbrella of cryptography. Wait, wow. That's really interesting. I didn't know that. Um, so obviously if you know Bitcoin, you've probably heard of SHA-256. Can you explain sort of just very simply what it is? I know it stands for secure hash algorithm, right? That's the SHA-256 is bits, how many bits there are. So can you kind of go over that and why that's important? Yeah, definitely. So there are a number of different types of hashing implementations or algorithms, if you will. And Satoshi selected SHA-256 for Bitcoin. Now there's a couple other hashing algorithms also used in Bitcoin. We've got uh, HMAC SHA-512, we've got RIPEMD-160, but SHA-256 is the one that we use the most and it's the one that we use extensively in mining. So like you said, SHA is a very creative acronym that stands for secure hash algorithm. And the 256 part denotes the length of the output. So when we talk about the output as being a fixed length summary or fingerprint, that fixed length is 256 bits or 256 ones and zeros, those binary digits that computers can understand very well, but our human brains struggle a little bit to comprehend. Now, 256 bits is a number that's so large, um, it's actually incomprehensible to our human minds. Mm -hmm. This number is two to the 256th power. It's equivalent in decimal to around 10 to the 77th power. So think of 77 zeros. It doesn't actually sound that big, but it represents approximately all of the atoms in the known universe. Wow. So yeah, imagine, I saw that. imagine trying to pluck a particular atom out of the universe and say, oh, yes, this is the one that I was looking for. You know, it would be impossible to find a particular atom on earth, let alone the universe, just like it would be possible to guess the input to a SHA-256 hash. Similarly, the private keys that are used to unlock your Bitcoin on the Bitcoin blockchain are also 256 bits. Wow, that's incredible. Okay, well, so you mentioned, okay, you have the hash, you have an input, and then it gets mixed around and you have a yeah. certain output. You can't go backwards. Um, yes. With the output, that's a fixed number, right? So, And if you change anything about the input, if you add a letter, if you change the video, if you add an extra picture, it's going to change the output, right? But if you put in the same video or the same word, it should generate the same hash output, right? Exactly. Because it's deterministic. The same input will always yield the same output. But like you said, any minor change to the input, even one pixel in my cat's photo or one character in an entire book will yield an entirely different output. It looks random. It's not random. It's deterministic. But for all intents and purposes, it looks random because there is no clue as to, as to what, what about from. the input changed or what the input was. But it's very clear that something was changed. So a great example of a use case for SHA outside of Bitcoin is my hope is that when my favorite websites store my password on their servers, my hope is that they store a hash of my password as opposed to storing it in clear text. Meaning right. if anyone were to compromise their data or if any employees had access to their server, they wouldn't be able to see my password. Now it would be um, very quick to verify my password and hash it and compare the result of that hash with the hash stored on the server. And this is how most websites, if they're secure, work today. That's so fascinating. Okay, so um, I don't know if you wanna bring up a visual because I know you created a website to help 
crystallize this for, for people, but let's talk a little bit more about the hash function. So basically when you put it, when you put a number in, let's say, and this is essentially what mining computers are doing, right? Bitcoin mining computers are generating a hash and they're, they're trying to compare it against another number. So can, let's talk about the process. Like how do Bitcoin mining computers use hash? Yeah, totally. So let's just do an example of what the output of SHA looks like. So if you could just give me any input, it could be a word or a short phrase or a sentence, and we'll pop it into SHA. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. okay so awesome. how, let's do Satoshi because we owe all of this to Satoshi. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, the output of the SHA-256 hash of Satoshi is this result. And this is a huge number. This is a number. Now it's in kind of a funny compressed number format. It's still going to be 256 binary digits, but I compressed it down to 64, what are called hexadecimal digits. Don't worry if you don't know what that means. Um, it's simply a very compact, compressed number format. That's a little easier for us humans to read than binary. So this is this huge 32 byte result of the hash of Satoshi. So if I make any change whatsoever to that input, the result is going to change completely with no clue as to what was changed. So, um, so let's add it. 21. Okay, we're gonna say Satoshi 21. And the result, as you can see, is completely different. But if you delete the 21, you go back to Satoshi, it's the same result as before, right? Exactly, because it's deterministic. But there's no way of knowing how the hash will change mm -hmm. until we hash around and find out. We have to actually hash the input for us to know how the result will look. There's no way of predicting it. Okay, so what are the Bitcoin mining computers doing? Because there's a comparison of numbers that's happening very, very quickly, right? Right. So, okay, so in mining, what we're doing is instead of hashing a word or phrase, we are hashing a Bitcoin block. So a Bitcoin block is going to have some metadata in the block header, and it's going to have some Bitcoin transactions in the body of the block. So we are going to hash the header of the Bitcoin block. So I'll show you what that looks like. Perfect. And just for the folks watching that are a little bit newer to this, the block is the list of transactions that we're trying to add to the chain, the blockchain, the public ledger that's broadcast across the entire network that has to be verified by consensus. So the block is what you're actually entering into the hash, but it's it's really just the Bitcoin block header, right? And there's a nonce in there, which I know you'll explain. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. So the block header does have a summary of all of the transactions in the header. The summary is called the Merkle root. Um, that's kind of outside of the scope of today's talk, all of the contents of the block. But like you said, what we're doing is we're adding new transactions to this Bitcoin public ledger. So for this example, I created a simulator of how mining works in JavaScript. And I'm gonna show you if I take this Bitcoin block and I hash it, I'm gonna get a number. Right, so let's put this block into SHA and we get this result that I highlighted, which again is a really big number. Now, the okay, way wait, wait. scroll up yes. just one second. So, yes. um, you took the header, right? The header right there that has the metadata you mentioned. Um, and right there under it, before you clicked hash, right next to that is nonce. Is that important to explain? It is. So let's explain what that means. So I'm looking at the hash of my block and the hash is going to be a number. The way Bitcoin works, like I said, is we're comparing two numbers in the mining process. I'm looking to see if the hash result is less than or equal to another number. That other number is called a target. Okay. So if my block header hash is less than a given target, I found a valid Bitcoin block. Now, because I found a Bitcoin block, I get rewarded with the honor of adding that block to the immutable Bitcoin blockchain. And I also get rewarded with 6.25 Bitcoin, plus all of the fees for all of the transactions in the body of my block. So to your point, what is this nonce value in the header? 
Okay, so we want our block to be less than a given target when hashed. But in my example, I get this really big number when I hashed my block. And is that number less than this target? Well, when you're comparing two really big numbers, an easy way of doing it if they have the same number of digits, which these two numbers do, is to look at the number of zeros in the beginning of those numbers. And I have one zero leading my target and I have no zeros leading my hash. So is my hash less than my target? Nope. It's not. So what we talked about earlier was when I make any changes to the input of SHA, the output changes completely. Mm -hmm. And there's no way of knowing how it's going to change unless we hash around and find out. Mm -hmm. So could we add some arbitrary random data somewhere in the block and then find a hash of the new block and see if the new hash is less than the target? Yes. Right. It it might seem a little archaic, but that's actually how mining works. So we're going to try adding a random number to the block. So could you give me an example of a random number? I can add it to the block. We can see how the hash changes. Let's add 21 million. Okay. 21 million. All right. I'm going to add 21. I'm going to add this to the block header. It's going to change the hash entirely. So let's see how the hash changes. Okay. So the hash changes completely. There's no way of predicting how it's going to change unless we hash around and find out. But is the new resulting hash less than the given difficulty target? No. No, no, no zeros in the beginning of that number. So what we're going to do is we're going to guess and check random numbers until we find the one that when plugged into the block yields a valid hash. So these less than our target. So these Bitcoin mining computers, they're not so much solving these complicated cryptographic puzzles. They're essentially just guessing and checking numbers, guessing and checking numbers. Yep. It's a brute force process. It's actually really simple. You know, um, if I brute forced your password, would you say that I was solving a cryptographic puzzle or I was solving a really hard math problem? No, I was just guessing different possible inputs. So That's exactly how mining works. Now, these miners are really, really good at guessing. They're really, really good at doing SHA. So Mm -hmm. in fact, they're so good at doing SHA that the hardware has been designed specifically to only do SHA. And that's why we consider mining to be um, application specific. We use ASICs or application specific integrated circuits. They're designed to just do SHA really, really, really fast. So, This random number that I'm popping into the block header, like you said, it has a special name and that's a nonce. Um, A nonce is a number used once. It's just a random number. And you're going to see nonces all over the place in cryptography. So the process of mining is the process of finding that golden nonce that when plugged into the block yields a hash less than a given target. Now, the target that I use for my simulator is a much, much, much larger number than the target that's being used on Bitcoin mainnet. The target that's being used on Bitcoin mainnet has a lot, lot, lot of zeros in the beginning of the number. Um, But in order for us to mine by hand, to do manual mining without the help of an ASIC, Mm -hmm. I made that difficulty target much, much, much higher such that it's quite easy to find a hash that's under that threshold. Got it. Okay. And let's explain just for a moment um, the fact that, you know, number, multiple numbers can be found that are less than the target, right? So we have mining computers that are distributed, decentralized all over the world, competing against each other. And sometimes maybe two might find a block at the same time, right? Can you kind of go into that? Yeah, totally. So, okay. So for my example, because our difficulty target is a pretty big number, like you said, there's going to be multiple nonces that will be valid. So in this example, one in every 16 tries is actually going to be valid because um, there's actually four leading zeros in the difficulty target in binary and two to the fourth power is 16. Um, So let me, okay, let me just actually kind of show you how this works. And then I would love to get into 
your question about what happens if more than one miner finds a block right. at the same time. So um, you guessed 21 million, but do you want to try guessing some other numbers and see if we can find a valid block? Sure. So I'll let's guess my my uh, birth year, 1986. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Like I said, one in every 16 approximately is going to be a winning nonce. And we've guessed twice and so far, no luck. 125. Okay. 125. Oh, okay. So that's that's a valid block. So um, with the nonce 125, we're going to call that a golden nonce. Um, See how the hash of the block has a zero Mm-hmm. as the first digit. Yep. What that means is it's less than or equal to this difficulty target. Got it. So we found a block. Um, and to your point, there are multiple answers that would be valid. In this case, one in every 16. In the case of Bitcoin on the main net, um, your chances are very, very, very slim. But okay. to your point, um, you could have two or more valid answers that were found simultaneously by two different miners. So that, that has happened in the past. And if that does happen, we do what's called a reorg, meaning one of the blocks is going to get orphaned. (laughs) Um, Poor guy, whoever found the block that got orphaned. Um, But basically, whichever node heard about a particular block first is going to start mining on that block, meaning the other block is going to get orphaned. Got it. And then those nodes share it to the next nodes to the next because it's a peer-to-peer network. Um, I might ask you one more question about that. But first, let's kind of briefly touch on the difficulty target because that does change. And I think this is one of the most brilliant aspects to Satoshi's programming of Bitcoin personally. Um, So I want to hear how you kind of describe the difficulty adjustment and how important that is to all of this. This episode is also brought to you by one of my favorite companies in the space, Fold. Fold is the easiest and most fun way to earn Bitcoin on everything you do. So if you're interested in Bitcoin, but you really don't know where to start, Fold is the perfect app. There's a daily wheel that you can spin every day for free and you can earn Bitcoin, free Satoshi. Seriously, there's no catch. And one of my other favorite things is their card, the Fold debit card. You can actually earn Bitcoin back on every single purchase. So make sure to download the Fold app today. There's a referral link in the description. So I want to hear how you kind of describe the difficulty adjustment and how important that is to all of this. Yeah, to your point. So yeah, to your point, the difficulty target and the difficulty adjustment was Satoshi's novel contribution to Bitcoin because Satoshi took a bunch of existing technologies and put them together like a puzzle piece. But the new contribution was the difficulty adjustment. So in Bitcoin, we expect blocks to be found on average once every 10 minutes. It's a random guess and check process. So sometimes we find blocks in less than 10 minutes and sometimes we find blocks in more than 10 minutes, but on average, it's around 10 minutes. So that difficulty target is calculated such that on average, we're going to find a block every 10 minutes. And every 2016 blocks, which is approximately every two weeks, Bitcoin does a difficulty adjustment. And what it looks at is the previous 2015 blocks and sees if they were coming in a little faster than 10 minutes or a little slower than 10 minutes. If they were coming in a little faster than 10 minutes, then it's going to make it a little harder to find a block. If they came in a little slower than 10 minutes, it's going to make it a little easier to find a block. And it does this by changing the target. So if the blocks were coming in too fast, I'm going to make it a little harder to find a Bitcoin block. I'm going to ramp the difficulty up. Am I going to take the difficulty target and make it bigger or smaller? To make it easier, you make the the difficulty target a smaller number, right? So if the number is... So you make the number, the, the, the number bigger. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So because I want my, my hash to be under that threshold, if the threshold becomes a higher number, it becomes easier to find a block. You know, it's funny. I, um, I came up with a way to describe the difficulty adjustment that I think visually makes so much sense to me, but I'm curious what you think. So can I, can I just kind of share it with you? Yeah. So I did sort of understand that it was a process of guessing a number, 
And the way that I equated it always was think of a bicycle combination. Um, because one thing that's interesting that I think people have a difficult time with when they think of mining is how can something be difficult to solve, but easy to verify. So the way that I thought of it is you have a bicycle combination and let's say it's four, four digits. So you try one, 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 and then one, 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 two, and one, 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 three. And the process would take us forever, right? As humans, but a computer could probably do it very, very quickly. And then bam, there's a certain combination that actually unlocks it. And everyone can verify that the bicycle lock unlocked, right? It, you allowed you to access your cycle. Um, so boom, you got it right. Now the difficulty adjustment, the way I've explained it is now add, make it a 26 digit combination. And now you have to try so many more. You need a lot more power essentially to solve it. But, it, but once you crack that code, you unlock it and bam, does that make sense to you? Does, is that like something that you would say is similar to the difficulty adjustment in any way? Yes. I like that because it's really, really hard to find a block, but it's super easy to verify that the block is following the rules of Bitcoin. And you can even do that on very inexpensive hardware, meaning folks who don't have mm -hmm. access to, you know, fancy, expensive MacBooks can get um, inexpensive hardware around the world and they can verify the Bitcoin blockchain for themselves. But that's, that's what makes Bitcoin decentralized. Yeah. And essentially, as opposed to my example, this is you're not actually looking for necessarily the combination. You're looking for a number less than the combination. So what you're creating is actually probably the hashes are often bigger numbers and you're trying to get a number less than. Right. That's right. That's how I'm updating my kind of analogy of this. Um, OK, so do you want to share anything just in terms of the difference between, I guess, the miners and then the nodes and how they operate together? Yeah, absolutely. So there's two different kinds of nodes. I like the way Michael Saylor describes it. He says that there are validating nodes and there are security nodes. So the miners are the security nodes and the full node operators are the validating nodes. So um, one cool thing that I did uh, around this time last year, I think it's been about a year now, is I pioneered a community of Lightning and Bitcoin full node operators called Plebnet. And anyone can join at plebnet.org and we help people get going with running a node. Now running a node doesn't mean you have to mine Bitcoin. It just means that you are validating the rules of Bitcoin. And if you're also running a lightning node, then you're routing payments um, on people's behalf, which is really, really cool. Now in the early days of Bitcoin, a node was a node was a node was a node. You would just download Bitcoin. It would be a mining node, a validating node, and also your wallet all in one. And we've since like split up those functionalities. Got it. What are the biggest misconceptions or maybe the biggest hurdles that you've heard from your work educating people in terms of really understanding Bitcoin? Why do you think it's so difficult or maybe intimidating for people? What's well, a paradigm shift? So it's not something that we're used to wrapping our heads around and it pulls from a number of distinct fields not just including computer science and cryptography, but also economics and game theory and network effects. So it's really this umbrella of all of these incredible different um, disciplines rolled into one. And what I found is if someone is really hyper-specialized in only one of those fields, they sometimes have trouble understanding Bitcoin because they can't see the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. What do you say to people that don't understand the programming and really the, the, the mathematics and computer science that goes into all of this who say, well, it's digital and things can be hacked or things can be compromised? What's your response to that? Um, so Bitcoin has never been hacked in the 13 years that it's been in operation. It is completely rock solid. Um, people can be hacked, meaning if I don't have really great security, then I can personally be hacked. But the Bitcoin network has never been compromised. Now that said, with regard to the fact that Bitcoin is a digital asset, um, so are other assets. You know, the money in my bank account is also digital. We don't have anything physical to back that up. So I think we're already accustomed to using things that are digital. As far as the energy consumption, do you have thoughts on that? Do you, do you focus any of your work in terms of educating people on why we should be pro mining and proof of work as opposed to some of the other protocols that are out there or the folks that say, hey, we shouldn't be using energy in order to mine Bitcoin? Yeah, so the energy consumption of Bitcoin is a feature, not a bug, meaning we want Bitcoin to use electricity because that electricity is used to secure the network. And when we're securing the wealth of the entire planet, 
um, that's really important, right? So it's not some kind of superfluous use of electricity. And I don't think that there's any alternative with regard to proof of work. Um, the other so-called consensus mechanisms, such as proof of stake, um, aren't fair in the way that Bitcoin is fair. And that's one of the reasons why I love Bitcoin so much is the fairness protocol. It's a set of rules without rulers. And in a proof of stake system, which is similar to sort of the fiat monetary system of the past, um, folks who have the biggest stake get the most decision-making decision power and also get access to additional wealth uh, due to the Cantillon effect, which is the effect by which um, the folks who are closest to the spigot or the source of money benefit their most from the creation of that money. Uh, Bitcoin eliminates the Cantillon effect. And in the meantime, it reverses it, meaning the folks who are the furthest away from the creation of money tend to benefit the most. And I like to think of this as being the last will be first and the first will be last in a Bitcoin world temporarily until the Cantillon effect is completely eradicated. I know. I love that idea of this is the greatest opportunity for a wealth transfer to the people who need it the most, potentially. Um, as far as mining pools go, when I hear about mining, more and more I hear about mining pools. I've even interviewed people that are part of mining pools. Can you explain what mining pools are to people? And there's a criticism that, well, if people are pooling resources, then that could create almost monopolies or advantages in certain people being able to mine more Bitcoin. What's your response? Yeah, totally. So the way that mining works is such that if I'm just guessing and checking these nonce values on my own, the statistical likelihood that I will ever find a block is very low. I might never find a block in my lifetime. And um, if I do get lucky enough to find a block, it might be 20 years from now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pool together my resources with other miners. And if any one of us finds that golden nonce, then we share the profits. You can kind of think of this as being like a lottery ticket. If I try and win the, you know, super Powerball or whatever it's called, I'll probably never win in my lifetime. But if I get, you know, all of my friends and maybe all of the people in my entire city to pool together their lottery tickets, the chances that one of us are going to win are actually quite high. So I think um, pretty much everyone is using a mining pool right now. There are some folks who are solo mining, but that's kind of just you know, more of like a lottery kind of crap shoot that's likely not going to pan out. And, um, you know, there's no risk to centralization in mining pools because mining pools um, are simply just made up of individual miners. And those miners can change pools at any time. Do you see any threats in terms of just, you know, this technology so well inside and out and you understand mining? Are there any threats to this, to this protocol? If I thought there were threats, I wouldn't have dedicated my life to Bitcoin and I wouldn't have put my wealth in Bitcoin. I love that. Um, what else do you want people to know? I know that you have a company, you want to educate the public, you want to help them down the rabbit hole of specifically Bitcoin mining and, and other aspects of this network. So what do you want people to know? Yeah, I've dedicated my life to helping people understand Bitcoin. I actually recently launched a corporate Bitcoin education company called Cypher. So Cypher is the premier Bitcoin education company for businesses and their employees. So that's my pet project for the moment. 